photo and imagine a pregnant woman walking down this alley on a rainy day. Or a fire incident, God forbid, when the fire truck has no way to reach the house at the end of the alley. On the other hand, the dirty water running just beside the bedroom is not welcomed by anyone, not even for people living in slums. For instance, in the qualitative study, we found respondents saying, here there is no drainage system, water gets clogged beside my room. We always have bad smell surrounding us, but even so, we still are living here. Another dimension of an entrance. Try, even in your head, to reach the room down this alley during night time. Scary, huh? Continue your walk and then take your pick. Get into a room. You are likely to find that most room size is about 48 square feet per person. Rooms may look like this. However, Please keep in mind that variations do exist when it comes to household assets and room size. We have seen green ones and ones that look like this. Or some may look like this one, which trust me, is tidier than the room where I live in. Now comes the most important part, cooking and eating. Almost half of the slum households cook outside of their house and the cooking place would be shared in most cases. Still, most food preparation takes place in the same room where we sleep. At the same time, you would find that studio apartment has its own definition here, where families cook, eat, sleep, leave in the same room. Let's see how are we doing with electricity. Based on the report, accessing to electricity may be universal, but keep the splicing in mind that takes place in slums around the country. Nonetheless, there were cases where we found meters and legal lines as well. Let's go from electricity to water. In the report, you would find that 60% of slum dwellers have access to piped water, something to be happy about. But the long line of buckets may indicate not having continuous water supply. Then there is the case of waiting time. Even if the water is coming apparently from a tube oil. In this case, the tube oil is just a medium of pumping the water from the reservoir tank that gets filled with water supply water only twice a day. Now to give a closer look to the woman with the baton. It's actually a pipe from which water is coming in drops and it takes about 40 minutes to collect one pitcher of cooking and drinking water. Now let's see how are we doing with toilets. Looking at this photo, we can be happy about having improved and clean toilets, even in the slums. Nevertheless, the main factor in this case was the community rotation system for cleaning and maintenance. In the qualitative study, we had respondents saying, we told the household owner several times, he doesn't manage to get somebody to clean the toilet and leaves the toilet uncleaned, their household. But in a lot of cases, this is how the open space may look like. There is also one in seven slum dweller that disposes the waste in a bin outside the house. Garbage collection, is yet another story. <coughs> and amid all this chaos and noise, around 10 million slum population of Bangladesh live a life, laugh every now and then, learn to grow, and move towards tomorrow. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Nani Kamal of Measure Evaluation to talk about migration.
Four set of findings will be presented today. We will look at the length of stay of migrants in urban areas, the place of origin of slum dwellers in Dhaka and Chittagong, the economic status of recent and longer term migrants, and finally, we will look at the reasons for migration activities. The first set of findings shows that a substantial part of urban residents are migrants. Respondents in our survey were asked how long they had been living at the place of urban residents. And in slums, two-thirds or 67% of women are reported to be migrants. The proportion of migrants is relatively smaller in the other two urban domains, 58 and 46%, highlighting the fact that non-slum populations are relatively more stable or permanent, where migration is less common than in slums. We have categorized migrants into recent and longer term migrants depending on whether they have lived for less than or more than five years at the place of current residence. The yellow portion at the bottom of each stack bar corresponds to recent migrants and it is higher for slums, 20% compared with 30% of the other, other urban domain. This is the distribution of length of stay among men by each domain and it is very similar to what we had seen for women in the previous slide. In slums, two-thirds or 66% of male residents are <coughs> compared with lower proportions, 58 and 33% in other urban areas. This again points to the transient nature of slum settlements. And as we have seen for women in the previous slide, the percentage of recent migrants represented in yellow that is, those who have lived at their current residence for less than five years is higher in slums, 12%, than, than in the other, other urban domains. This decline is possibly because the newer migrants could have a survey sample. It may be that the large slum turning to the place of origin of female residents in Chittagong slums, over two thirds, or 68% of the Chittagong division itself. And the distribution of residents. The economic status of slum migrants is by duration of stay shows that recent migrants are in slums by length of stay. And they are all over 20%, suggesting that the poor are overrepresented in slums. 64% of women who migrated within the last two years belong to households in the poorest wealth sector, compared with 39% of those who migrated over five years ago. This pattern is similar for men, that is, recent migrants are poorer than older migrants. There are two possible explanations for this phenomenon. One, that the economic condition of slum migrants improves over time as they spend longer in cities. And two, that the new migrants are selectively poorer than the ones who had migrated earlier. <coughs> Finally, we turn to the reported reasons for migrating to cities. The orange bars represent men and the yellow ones represent women. The reasons for migration are different for our sample of ever married men and women. In slums, men are most likely to migrate to look for work. Women, on the other hand, are most likely to migrate to join family. Although looking for work is also an important factor or reason for migration among slum women. The reasons for migration are similar in non slum areas, that is, men migrate to cities looking for work and women to join family. Environmental reasons like river erosion, flooding, or increase in water salinity did not explicitly come up as a major reason for migration to cities in our survey, although these factors could lead to loss of livelihoods and indirectly act as push factors for migration. Here is a recap of the main findings on migration. Two thirds of slum dwellers are migrants, while the remaining third has always lived there. The proportion of recent slum migrants <coughs> declined between 2006 and 2015 possibly because new migrants to cities are increasingly settling outside of city corporations in the periphery. Most of the residents of Dhaka and Chittagong slums are from, from the same division, followed by the region. Migration from the eastern and western divisions to these city slums is not that common. 
Recent migrants are poorer than longer term migrants, either because the newcomers are selectively poorer or that economic conditions improve as is better known to our cities. And finally, men migrate to cities in search of work and women to join family or spouse. That is all on migration from the 2013 Urban Health Survey. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Kanta Jamil, USAID Bangladesh, for the next presentation. Presenter before we take a tea break, I'll present the certain findings on fertility and family planning. The topics that will be covered are fertility levels in the three urban areas, teenage pregnancy, family planning use and sources of contraceptive supplies, fertility preference and intention to use permanent methods among women who do not want any more children. Fertility level is estimated by the total fertility rate. The PFR measures the number of births a woman would have in her lifetime. Fertility has reached below replacement level in all the three urban areas. We estimate that the replacement level of fertility in urban Bangladesh is around 2.1 births per woman. The TFR is 2 in the slums, 1.7 in one slums, and 1.9 in other urban areas. It may be noted that Bangladesh's goal is to reach TFR of 2 by 2016. We find that this goal has been reached ahead of time in all the other three areas, including the slums. So here is one more success story of the Bangladesh Health Program. This slide shows the changes in fertility between 2006 and 2013. In the slums, TFR has declined from 2.5 births in 2006 to just 2 in 2013, a reduction of more than half a child in 7 years. This is a remarkable positive change in reproductive behavior among women living in the slums. Fertility continues to decline in non-slums from 1.9 births to 1.7. We cannot compare the change in fertility rate in the other urban areas, since the other urban areas are defined a bit as, um, uh, differently in the two surveys. In the next two slides, we examine teenage pregnancy. Around 20% of adolescents began childbearing in the slums and other urban areas. In non-slums, the teenage childbearing is less common. One reason for this difference in teenage childbearing is that age of marriage is slightly higher in the non-slums compared to the other two areas. This slide shows that there has been no reduction in teenage childbearing in slums and non slums in the seven years. This is an area of concern and warrant more, more further examination. I will now present some of our findings on family planning. Contraceptive prevalence rate has reached 70% in the slums, 65% in non slums, and 67% in other urban areas. It is a surprise, at least to us, that contraceptive use is higher among women in slums compared to non-slums. Bangladesh's goal is to achieve a contraceptive pregnancy rate of 72% by 2016. The population living in the urban slums is closest to reach the goal. The most commonly used method is the oral pill in all the three urban areas. One third of women living in the slums and other urban areas rely on pills. Among non-slum population, pill use is a bit lower. What is the second most popular method? It varies by urban areas. In the slums, it is injectables with a news rate of 18%. The prevalence of injectables in slums is substantially higher than the national prevalence of injectables at 11%. In non-slums, the second most popular method is condoms, with a use rate of 16%. In this population, condom is almost three times higher than the national condom prevalence rate of less than 6%. In other urban areas, injectables, condoms, and traditional methods are all ranked as the second most likely method used. Use rate of each of these methods is 9%. 
The use of long-acting and permanent methods like IUD implants and sterilization is low, varying between 5 and 7 percent across the three urban areas. The use of traditional methods ranges between 7 and 9 percent. This level of traditional method use is observed in different demographic surveys since the 1990s. Between 2006 and 2013, contraceptive use increased sharply in the slums by 12 percentage points. In comparison, the change in contraceptive use in non-slums was marginal. It increased only 2 percentage points in 7 years. It is interesting to note that in 2006, contraceptive use was 5 percentage points lower in slums than in non-slums. By 2013, contraceptive use is 5 percentage points higher in slums than in non-slums. This slide shows the sources used to obtain the most recent contraceptive supply. Almost 70% of modern contraceptive method users in slums and other urban areas get their method from the private sector. Among non-slum women, a higher percentage, 82%, obtains contraceptives from the private sector. The high private sector share is associated with high use of pill and condoms, which are mostly bought from pharmacies and shops. Blue Star pharmacies are widely available where injectables can be obtained. These pharmacies are also the most widely used source for injectable supply for women in slums and non-slums. The long-acting and permanent methods are obtained mostly from the public sector in all the three urban areas. Note that among the three urban areas, the public sector as a source of contraceptive supply is more prominent in other urban areas where one in four method users obtain contraceptives from the, private, from the public sector. The next slide shows the change in source of contraceptive supply in the urban areas in the last seven years. The private sector is increasingly dominating the contraceptive market. In the slums, private sector share increased from 56% in 2006 to about 70% in 2013. The NGO share declined from 22% to 15% during this period. The decline in the public sector share is similar to that of NGO. In the non-slums, the share of private sector increased from 70% to 80% between 2006 and 2013. In the next two slides, we look at fertility preference and the intention to use the permanent method among those who do not want any more children. Close to 60% of women do not want any more children. Another 20% want to have another child later. Both these groups of women are potentially suited to adopt long-acting methods like IUDs and implants, and those who do not want any more children are potentially suited to want permanent methods. In the next slide, we present information on intention to use permanent methods within the next one year among women who do not want any more children. Women who said that they don't want any more children were asked if they have heard about permanent methods. 90% reported that they have heard about these methods. However, while the awareness of permanent method is high, the intention to adopt one in the next 12 months is extremely low, less than 2%. It may be noted that having heard of permanent methods does not mean that women have complete and accurate knowledge of these methods. Misconceptions about permanent methods are common. To summarize, urban women, including those from the slums, have below replacement level fertility. Although teenage childbearing is less common in urban areas compared to rural Bangladesh, it is still a problem in the slums and other urban areas. There has been no reduction in teenage childbearing in the last seven years. Contraceptive use rate is quite high and highest in the slums. However, it is low. Although the awareness of permanent methods is universal, the intention to adopt them is very low. With my presentation, we can do the first part of dissemination of the Urban Health Survey results. Thank you. Respected audience, if you have any questions on this presentation, please note it down on the sheets of paper provided in your folders. You can drop the questions in the boxes provided on the two tables at the sides of the dais, or hand them over to our volunteers. All your queries will be addressed once the presentations are complete. 
We are now going to pray for tea and namaz. Tea has been served in the room to the right of this hall. In this part of the presentation, we will be using the term quite often, medically trained provider, as the, as the most critical care provider for antenatal delivery and postnatal care. Medical trained provider as defined here include qualified doctors, nurses, midwives, paramedics, FWBs, CSBAs, and medical systems as sufferers. We first look at the coverage of antenatal care in the three different types of urban populations. In this slide, we present data on any ANC from any provider and any ANC from medically trained providers. Both here we have issues. Ladies and gentlemen, the chief guest of the seminar, Mr. Mohamed Nasi, MP, Honorable Minister, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of People's Republic of Bangladesh, has just arrived. I would like to request the Honorable Minister to take his seat on the dais.